Hello everyone. In the previous videos we have talked a lot about the node approach, a neuroordinary differential equation approach, where we have tried to fit the right hand side of an ODE using an artificial neural network and solve everything together with an ODE description and an ODE solver. That worked more or less well depending on the amount of pre-knowledge which we have uh, put into the model structure for different application examples. In this video I would like to look at an alternative which specifically works directly in discrete time. The node approach, as it's an ordinary differential equation, basically works in a continuous time representation. And the discrete time representation can have two advantages depending on the specific application. First, sometimes we might only need in the given application a discrete time model because we want to utilize this model, for example, in a controller uh, which is implemented in an embedded hardware device where we need a description in discrete time. Or because we have real world data which we have obtained using discrete time measurements, it might be also interesting just to evaluate a model directly only at these discrete time steps, for example, due to computational aspects that I don't need to solve this ODE, which might have some additional overhead. And the idea with a discrete time nonlinear representation is basically to put this node idea, the node concept, directly into the discrete time domain. So what we do instead of evaluating and describing the model in continuous time using an ODE, we represent it directly as a state space difference equation. So x dot, uh, x hat at time step k plus one is equal to some f w hat at time step x k and u k, that's x hat by the way, giving some initial condition x0 hat, being x0 at the initial time step. And as an output equation, y hat of k is equal to g w hat at x hat of k and u of k. So that might be here also different parameters, so wf and wg for the state and for the output equation. And based on this discrete time representation of the model, we can define our usual loss function, so min wf wg, some loss function being the sum k equals one to n of x of k minus x hat of k for some mean squared error loss, okay? And that is basically just a direct representation of the node approach in discrete time. And as we directly look for this f hat and this g hat, which is now defined in discrete time, we do not need the ODE representation on the ODE solver which can have, I don't say it must, but which can have in certain application advantages. For example, if I'm not interested in a continuous representation on an ODE, but maybe just in the discrete time notation. Um, and based on the previous examples on the DC motor, on the thermal behavior of the DC motor, I now want to go through a discrete time representation using this difference equation approach as well. So in this notebook, we will discuss exactly this, a discrete time state space difference equation model. And we want to fit F, W um, in order to represent the dynamics of the DC motor. So we do not consider in this example the output equation for the sake of simplicity. The thermal behavior of the DC motor, you already have seen this in one of the previous videos. So baseline is we want to fit a discrete time model to this data, which is also represented, of course, on a discrete time grid. So the simulation data is representing discrete time data. We basically will uh, go through two variants of the discrete time modeling approach. The first one is basically a black box style modeling approach. And what I refer to that is that as can be seen here, we actually really model the state transition from x hat k to x hat k plus one without 
any pre-knowledge on the right-hand side of the difference equation. We just throw in all observables and estimates which we can have, so x hat itself, the load current, the load speed, and the ambient temperature, and that's it. So we don't assume any knowledge about f, w in terms of like the structure, as we have previously done it with these Hammerstein approaches. We don't do it here, and we also do not draft any additional expert features like loss-oriented features like i square or i times n square and so on. So this is like a really a bare-bone representation of this identification approach without any expert knowledge. You may remember that in the previous videos on the node approach that already went not so well because we had like divergent optimization problems or um, ODEs which basically uh, were instable numerically. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, since this is this black box approach, we first uh, standardized all the data. So we take samples of the current, uh, the speed, and the ambient temperature, and we standardize the um, data with respect to the set core transformation so that the data is neatly bias free and scaled with respect to the standard deviation of all of the signals. Then we also, of course, do the same for the generated ground truth data in order to ensure that we can fit the model in a latent temperature space so that the, the target temperature is actually also bias-free and scaled to its standard deviation. Then, after doing the pre-processing step, so we pre-process the input and output data, we define our right-hand side. Uh, the right-hand side is now a standard artificial neural network without any hidden layer. Uh, one little trick or two little tricks which we apply here is um, the weight initialization. We reduce that to a gain factor of uh, 0 0.05. So that means that the initial weights used for those artificial neural networks are in average scaled down. Uh, and we do that basically to ensure that the initial state transitions from xk to xk plus 1, that the change of state per time step is in average, in expectation, limited. So that the dynamics, the discretized dynamics, are not overly uh, unrealistic. A second trick, or smart decision, we could also call it, is that we use a 10h activation function because we have scaled all the input and output data, what we actually model in the latent space of the scaled data is that we model uh, scaled, normalized, standardized temperature changes. And that means that we do not need to model like a temperature change in like 10 degrees Celsius per time step, but basically the scaled version of it. So therefore the 10H activation function is normally sufficient because that would mean in the scale temperature change we need to um, consider a temperature change of basically a couple of percentage points and the 10H as such is of course capable of positive and negative state changes per time step. So if we would have used, for example, instead a sigmoid function, that would be not so clever because the sigmoid function in the output layer would only allow us to have positive state changes and not negative state changes. So, um, but also this is, I would say, not much, uh, let's say, expert pre-knowledge which we incorporate here, but more like smart choices. Okay, uh, with this right-hand side, we define our loss uh, function. The loss function here is a little bit differently defined uh, algorithmically as in the previous uh, examples because we basically now need to um, calculate everything in the discrete time domain and we do it in a non-mutating fashion such that we can apply algorithmic differentiation through the code um, and basically ensure that we can do a fast optimization using standard gradient descent methods. Here in this loss function, what we actually do is we only calculate x on every time step. So we do not get like an entire trajectory on x, but we basically calculate x on a recursive fashion, which allows us a non-mutating implementation. And then for every time step, we basically directly calculate the MSE loss between ground truth data and estimate. The prediction um, function is then 
little bit different. We do not use the prediction within the loss function. The prediction is separated from the loss here just for later inspection of the model accuracy where we basically have this mutating implementation such that we get the entire vector of x hat from the starting point of time until the last sample. Okay, then we define our optimization problem as usual. We solve the optimization problem using the ADAM solver, which converges very nicely um, on the training data. The endpoint is 21.4, which is, as I said, in this latent normalized temperature space. And then if we print the result, and of course, what is also done here in the cell, it's not shown here, but we also denormalize the, the data, of course, when we print it. We can see that the difference equation, this black box difference equation, is already doing quite a good job, right? So we see that most of the time the predicted temperature with the difference equation black box approach works quite well. We might have tiny bits of systematic modeling errors like here, there's a little systematic deviation, or also here at the beginning we see some dynamics which are not perfectly accounted for. But considering that we did not implement much pre-knowledge about the system, just smart choices about the right-hand side uh, artificial neural network of the difference equation, I would say the result is quite decent. What we can do now if we uh, want to improve the accuracy of our model a little bit further is, we can of course try to incorporate like a priori system knowledge in terms of structure, which would require a lot of, let's say, pre-knowledge. But as an intermediate step, we can also design expert-driven features, so observables to the right-hand side of this uh, representation. And how can we do that? Uh, we can basically just uh, consider that um, the power losses of the motor are represented or depending not on the current, but on the current square, so I square, and the iron losses were depending on I times N square. So what we do is we exchange the bare bone features I and N with I square and I times N square. So the entire structure on the right hand side is untouched. We just exchange the input features and trying to make more expert driven feature choices. Okay, so if we do that, um, the entire representation is identical. We of course need to apply now also standardization to this new features I square and I square N, which is basically done here. But the actual optimization and the actual model is identical. So that's why we do not need to define anything new here. We just need to load our new model feature inputs. So I square vec norm and I n square vec norm are basically the scaled versions of I square and I times n square. But the entire model structure, the optimization loop, blah, 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 that is untouched. Only the features are changed. And if you then do the optimization, it also converges very nicely and the final result in the latent temperature space is 14.65, which is significantly better than the 20 point something which we had in the black box case without any handcrafted expert features. And if we plot the result, we can basically see that these little issues which we had for example here in the, in the poor black box case without expert features could be improved a little bit. So what's the T, uh, K, the key takeaway messages of this approach. Uh, we have first seen that a state space difference equation, discrete time difference equation, can be also nicely applied to dynamic system identification. And we have once more seen the power of incorporating a decent amount of expert knowledge, here in the case of expert features, in order to improve the prediction and simulation model accuracy without the need of in-depth knowledge about the entire system dynamics. So it's always about a good compromise between uh, model flexibility using, for example, artificial neural networks and allow for adaption, but also trying to squeeze in the model into the right direction by incorporating pre-knowledge like the expert features in this today's video. This basically wraps up on the idea of nonlinear system identification using um, difference equations as an attention to ODEs. And in the subsequent video series, we will go into the details of more um, 
let's say, systematic feature engineering, which is not uh, limited to expert feature engineering, which is, of course, always application dependent. And we will also discuss about cross-validation and model selection in that sense. If I have um, different degrees of freedom in order to design the model or to pick a model, how we can do this on a systematic matter. I thank you for watching and see you in the next videos.